Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah Sellers is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, Traveler's Choice. Big changes in America's airports. This morning, masks are now optional on most domestic flights after a federal judge struck down a CDC mandate on planes and public transit. This is obviously a disappointing decision. The CDC continues recommending wearing a mask in public transit. We have team coverage this morning with more on the ruling and the mixed reaction, plus what this could mean for the fight against COVID. Assault on the East, a dangerous new phase of the war in Ukraine. This morning, the battle for Donbass now underway as Russia launches its offensive in the eastern part of the country. And at a steel plant in besieged Mariupol, a fierce fight between the last Ukrainian defenders and the Russians demanding their surrender. We're in Ukraine with the latest. Overwhelmed, growing concerns along the southern border as the number of migrants coming into the U.S. soars to record highs. Calls now to bring back controversial border restrictions with another major surge expected. And an opportunity of a lifetime for a high school shadowed, overshadowed by tragedy. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Marching Band now practicing to perform in the big Macy's Day Parade four years after the Parkland school shooting, how they're honoring the victims on the big stage. Good to have you with us. We begin this morning with that ruling by a federal judge in Florida. The decision overturns the Biden administration's mask mandate on planes, trains, and other forms of public transportation. Now, the judge said the CDC exceeded its authority by issuing a public health measure requiring masks. Soon after, the White House announced that the TSA would stop enforcing the measure the major airlines followed suit. The ruling comes just days after the Biden administration had actually extended the mandate by 15 days into early May as COVID cases once again begin to creep up across the country. We have full team coverage of the ruling. Dr. Amish Adalja is here for more on what this means for Americans going forward. And NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards has the latest from the World Vaccine Congress in Washington. But we begin with NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton, who's live for us from JFK Airport here in New York. Antonia, good morning to you. So let's start with the judge's ruling. What was the reasoning behind her decision and what are you hearing from travelers so far? Good morning, Joe. This judge in Florida struck down the CDC's mask mandate, calling it unlawful and basically arguing that the CDC had extended or gone outside of its own authority. And the administration, the CDC, had announced an extension of this mask mandate in response to the spread of Omicron subvariant 2 as an effort to tackle the spread, to minimize the spread in cities like New York City for the next couple of weeks. What we're seeing now here in terms of response is it's about 50 50. Some passengers still committed right now to wearing masks, seeming like that's what's most comfortable for travel right now. And then others who were excited to rip their masks off. You know, we have colleagues who took a flight this morning and were describing seeing people still wearing masks on a Delta flight uh, from D.C. over to Atlanta. And, you know, I think what we're going to see right now, especially in cities like New York, where people have been pretty committed and comfortable with mask wearing, is a slow transition over the next couple of days. And there are certainly some travelers who have continued to say that, you know, masks for them are important for family members who are immunocompromised, for, you know, health and safety reasons, as they're fearful of catching the Omicron variant over the next couple of weeks. But there's certainly going to be this adjustment period because people have been wearing these masks on planes for the last two years, Joe. So, Antonia, I mean, we know many of the major airlines quickly dropped the requirement that passengers wear masks. They've been pushing for this mandate to go away recently. What has been the reaction from the airline industry in general? And what about other mass transit operators? I understand some of them are still going to keep the mask mandate in effect. That's right. In terms of the airline industry, you know, for weeks, many of the airline industry leaders have been signaling that they wanted this mask mandate to come to an end. In fact, the CEO of Delta has long been publicly arguing that an end to the mask mandate on flights was a critical part of returning to normalcy, of getting the airline industry back entirely and up on its feet. And so for much of the airline industry, this was welcome news. There were reports that last night 
you know, pilots were going out over their PA systems and cheering, declaring that passengers should be happy, they can take their masks off. But as you mentioned, that is not the case across the rest of the public transit system, particularly if you live in the New York area. Here in New York, the MTA is still going to require masks, at least at this time. New Jersey Transit was also initially going to require masks, but they recently uh, have decided that they will not be. And so it's a little bit of a patchwork system now, but on flights, TSA is no longer enforcing the mask mandate, but throughout much of the New York system, you'll still see masks being required for passengers, Joe. And Antonia, what is the Biden administration saying about this ruling? Do we expect them to appeal it? You know, we don't know yet if they're going to appeal. What the Biden administration has said is that, frankly, they are disappointed with this decision and that they're reviewing their options. They're reviewing the decision and what steps they might be able to take going forward. And, you know, look, I think the plan was right, again, for this to be extended through May 3rd. But people initially thought that April 18th was going to be the end here. So, you know, you, you should actually take a listen to what Jen Psaki stated last night. She puts the administration's view on this and sort of evaluation for their next steps forward in her own terms. Take a listen. This is obviously a disappointing decision. The CDC continues recommending wearing a mask in public transit. Uh, as you know, this just came out this afternoon. So right now, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, who would be implementing, and the CDC are reviewing the decision. And of course, the Department of Justice uh, would make any determinations about litigation. While the administration has to evaluate its next steps, passengers are really going to be making their own, cho own choices now. This is really going to be about personal responsibility, which has been a message from many parts of the public transit system and from public health authorities around New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey in the last several weeks. And that's what we expect to see happen now, that passengers will have to decide for themselves what steps make them most comfortable for the health and safety of themselves and the people around them. Joe. Which is where this is heading in so many arenas. All right, Antonia Hilton, thank you so much. Now, this morning in Washington, vaccine experts from around the world are gathering to discuss what's working and what isn't in the battle against COVID-19. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards joins us now with more on that. So, Erica, this is the first in-person meeting for the World Vaccine Congress since the pandemic began. So much has changed about our understanding of vaccines, how they interact with COVID. What is the latest thinking on how long immunity lasts, both for people who are vaccinated and for those who've actually been infected with COVID in the past. That certainly is a key question for the vaccine experts gathered here at the World Vaccine Congress, which is about to kick off in about an hour or so here in Washington. Right now, it seems that uh, protection, either from vaccination or from infection, lasts about six months before it starts to wane, even sooner uh, if you have a weakened immune system. But, you know, giving boosters every six months is just not sustainable. One of the key questions that they will be talking about here at the, at the conference is how to build a longer lasting, more durable vaccine. Joe. So, Erica, what are experts saying about a possible long term vaccine against COVID? Is there any any agreement at all on when we might need the next booster, how those boosters are going to play out? Right, you know, as effective as these mRNA vaccines are, they just don't last as long as doctors had hoped they would. Right now, there is work ongoing. In fact, there's more than 150 vaccine candidates uh, in some stage of study or development worldwide, if you can believe that. As far as the boosters go, they do anticipate that we might need another one this fall, especially as the weather cools and as cases of those that BA2 subvariant continue to rise. Joe? All right, Erica Edwards in Washington. Erica, thank you so much. Let's bring in Dr. Amish Adalja for more on the latest COVID headlines. He's a senior scholar at John Ho Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. I think a lot of people want to hear from you right now, doctor. They may have some questions now with this mask mandate on transportation now going away. The CDC had extended it because of the rise in cases. So what is the risk for passengers now when they travel? Do you think now is a good time to be removing masks on public transportation? We've always needed off ramps for these government requirements for masks on public transit. And what we're talking about is a difference probably of two weeks of when the Biden administration had set this to expire versus what the judge decided. But I think the important point to remember is yes, masks work, but not everybody has the same risk, uh, risk preferences. And I think if you're someone that's fully vaccinated and healthy, COVID-19 is more of a nuisance infection to you. If you're somebody that's high risk, you can continue to wear a mask in those high risk situations, which might include being on a bus or on a subway. And one way masking works. 
<clears throat> when we're talking about airplanes, I think it's one of the lower risk things people do because of the, <clears throat> the number of air circulate, the, the number of air cycles that occur, how much the air is recycled, the filtration. So I don't think it really made sense to require masks on airplanes but not on everything else, which is much more high risk, for example, eating at bars. So I'm not so surprised about this. I'm not so worried about this because we're at a point now where I think individuals have to learn how to make risk calculations. And I think this is a good time to start. So the CDC made a travel decision that might have gone under the radar. The agency removed all countries from the highest COVID travel risk category, which is category four, reserving that for special circumstances only. So do these travel advisory lists make a difference? Should we be checking these lists before we travel internationally? Not so much. And I think it's kind of a folly to think that when you travel internationally, you have a higher risk of COVID than you do here in the United States. We know that COVID-19 is still circulating pretty heavily in the United States. There's tens of thousands of cases occurring every day. And I don't think that's much different in other countries. I don't. I, so I don't think looking for hotspots on the international list at this point makes sense. If something goes out of control, if something is different, that may change. But right now, I think your risk, domestic travel versus international travel is, is very similar. So I don't think that there's much benefit from a COVID perspective to look to see where the, the high risk spots are, because you can just assume that it's circulating everywhere. This is an endemic respiratory virus. Big picture, Dr. Deldra, how do we make sense of all these changing guidelines right now? And what are the precautions we should be taking before we leave as well as when we're traveling? A lot of this is going to boil down to individual risk tolerance and what your risk factors are for severe disease. We've really been stunted in this country because we kind of took an abstinence only approach where people were told, you know, never do this activity and didn't really generate the ability of the population to learn how to risk calculate, to learn how to decide what's high risk, what's low risk and how to navigate a world in which COVID-19 is ever present. Now I think people have to start to be able to do that, just like they do with other respiratory viruses. And hopefully there'll be more guidance. And, and you can expect guidance to change because it's going to be different. It's not going to be one size fits all. But we are, are transitioning to a point where people have to learn to navigate a world in which there's always going to be some non-zero risk of COVID-19, but a risk that's really manageable because of all the medical countermeasures we have. Dr. Amish Adolja, as always, appreciate your expertise. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. A new phase of the war in Ukraine is underway this morning. Ukraine now says Russia has launched an all-out ground attack in the eastern part of the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Russian forces are now fighting for the eastern part of the Donbass region along the Russian border. This new offensive follows a day of airstrikes across the country, including in the western city of Lviv, which has been relatively safe from attacks until now. At least seven people were killed in Lviv yesterday. Nearly a dozen others were hurt including a child. In a speech late yesterday, Ukraine's president told his people a large part of the Russian military is now focused on Donbass, but Ukraine will not stop fighting. NBC News global correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Lviv. So Raf, what do we know about this new phase of the war in the Donbass region and how is Russia changing its strategy there? So, Joe, you and I have been talking for literally weeks about Russia preparing for this all-out attack across the east. President Zelensky says that day has come. The Russians are attacking along a very, very long front, ranging from Kharkiv all the way up in the north, down through the Donbass, and ending in Mariupol in the south. Now, the Ukrainians say the Russians are throwing everything they have at this front. And an advisor to President Zelensky says they are under real pressure from Vladimir Putin to deliver something that he can call a victory for the Russian people. Take a listen. It will be a really difficult battle for Ukrainian armed forces, but Ukrainian armed forces who are concentrated there, uh, most of them have this experience of eight years war of in, in, in Donbass with Russia because the open war started in 2022, but the Russian aggression started in 2014 when they captured part of Donbass. So now this is the final battle for them. They have to make some symbolic victory. Now, President Zelensky says this is a battle his forces can win, but only if they get the heavy weapons they need from the United States, from other NATO allies. Ukraine has been preparing for this fight for a long time. They have sent some of their absolute best troops to the Eastern Front, but this will be a different kind of battle from what we've seen around Kyiv. The Ukrainians very successful there, hit and run, guerrilla tactics. Joe, this is going to be more of a World War II style confrontation along a very long front. 
with tanks and artillery confronting each other in open areas. Jeff? Raph, let's also talk about Lviv and the four uh, missile strikes yesterday. You were at the scene of those strikes. What more do we know about these attacks and why Russia is targeting Lviv in the west when their forces have really turned their focus to the east? Yeah, Jess, you can probably see behind me, things are actually pretty calm here right now. Folks are out and about on the streets. This time yesterday, the air raid sirens were blaring. A few hours before that, the missiles were raining down. We went to a car repair shop that was just over the railway lines that took a direct hit from one of those missiles. A number of people were killed there out of the seven who were killed in total. Eleven people were injured, including a child who was badly wounded. And this is Vladimir Putin reminding Ukrainians, reminding the world that nowhere in this country is out of range of his missiles. These wave of missiles, we now have a little more context for them. They were sort of the curtain going up on this offensive in the east. And I think it's a sign of Russia trying to do everything it can to cut off the Ukrainian railway lines, to try to stop Ukraine from moving the forces it needs, moving the equipment it needs from the west of the country, which is where NATO weapons are coming in, over to the east, where they will be needed for this new, very large-scale confrontation with Russian forces. Jeff? Yeah, and Raph, let's go back to the east. Throughout eastern Ukraine, places like Mariupol, there is a huge humanitarian crisis going on. No food, no running water, other basic supplies running out. The United Nations says now it doesn't appear to be the time for a ceasefire to allow more aid into Ukraine. So how are people in the region getting aid? Is anything getting to them at all? It doesn't look like it, Joe. The Russians have effectively sealed Mariupol off. They have the remaining Ukrainian troops in that city holed up in what's left of one of Europe's largest steel plants. There are concentric rings of Russian troops around them. But then the city itself, no one is coming in, no one is coming out without passing through Russian checkpoints. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says she has been desperately trying to get her Russian enemies to agree to a humanitarian corridor so women and children can come out of Mariupol, so food can come in. But the Russians are not agreeing to that at this point. The mayor of Mariupol says at least, at least 10,000 people have been killed in that city so far. The infrastructure is in absolute ruins. As you were saying, there's almost no food. The World Food Program says people are on the brink of starvation. They've been reduced to drinking filthy water just to try to survive. And now we are looking at massive disruption all across the east of Ukraine. There are going to be a lot more cities directly in the sights of Vladimir Putin's forces with more rockets, more artillery raining down on them. And one of the major challenges will be not only getting weapons and ammunition to the front lines to the soldiers, but also getting the humanitarian material we need to the east for the civilians. Jeff? Difficult situation that's only going to get harder as fighting intensifies in the eastern part of the country. Raf Sanchez, thanks so much for your reporting. Let's bring in Colonel Mark Kansian. He is the senior advisor for the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Good to have you with us. So I want to start with this new offensive in the east. Ukrainian President Zelensky says it is underway. But in a report in The New York Times, analysts said an initial Russian bombardment may just be a prelude to an all-out onslaught. What does that mean? What do we expect to see now? Well, this is likely the offensive we've been expecting for a couple of weeks. The Russians have been moving forces uh, to the east. They gave up in the north uh, and in the south and have focused on this area where they've been fighting for the last eight years. It's likely that this is the final phase of the war. Reports indicate that they're, there's fighting along the entire uh, front. If that's true, the Russians may be making the same uh, operational mistake that they've made through the entire war that is spreading their thin forces out uh, too much. Uh, that would be good news for the Ukrainians, bad news uh, for the Russians. One uh, concern is that the Russians might be able to get behind the Ukrainians who are uh, defending uh, in the east uh, um, at the um, uh, where the fighting has been going on for the last eight years. Uh, if the Russians can get behind the Ukrainians, that might push them out of their positions and uh, force a retreat. The good news is that the focus on the East means that the Russians have uh, uh, narrowed their war aims. They're not trying to take over the whole country. Now they're uh, trying to expand their um, uh, holdings uh, in the East. 
I want to ask more specifically about Mariupol, which we were just talking about with RAF. It's been the scene of the war's heaviest fighting, at least right now. We know Ukrainian forces there. They say they're going to fight until the end. How much longer can they hold out? And what would losing that key port city mean? Well, it's pretty clear that the valiant defense of Mariupol is coming to an end. The Ukrainian forces are being squeezed into smaller and smaller spaces. I think in the next couple of days, those forces will be uh, overwhelmed. The good news is that by holding out for a month, the Ukrainians have caused a lot of Russian casualties and have delayed the Russian uh, attacks in the east. The Russians have not been able to expand uh, their position there. Uh, the bad news is that when Mariupol falls, the Russians will be able to free up some forces uh, for the uh, offensive up north and maybe be able to endanger the Ukrainians from the rear. And there's been a lot of news made about the size of the latest U.S. military aid package, especially hundreds of anti-aircraft systems, thousands of anti-tank missiles and artillery rounds. Quickly on this last point, how quickly are those weapons getting used up? Well, they're being used very uh, rapidly. And uh, as a result, you know, these resupply is critical for the Ukrainian uh, resistance. The United States has been supplying about $50 million a day of aid, and I think that will continue the uh, that allows the Ukrainians to stay in the field and it gives them an advantage because the Russians are not getting resupplied they're uh, uh, using up their uh, existing stocks something interesting in this new package is the provision of US weapons the art artillery and the army personnel carriers but it will take many weeks for those to arrive on the front Colonel Mark Hansi and as always thanks so much for joining us we appreciate it Members of the World Central Kitchen are vowing to stay in eastern Ukraine even after four staffers were hurt in a missile strike in Kharkiv over the weekend. The World Central Kitchen has been in Ukraine since the war began, helping supply meals to people in the country. On Saturday, four people were hospitalized with burns, some severe after the strike. World Central Kitchen founder Jose Andre says the staffers are recovering and that his team plans on getting back to work helping the Ukrainians. Everybody said we want to keep cooking. So the good news is that while the four wounded are getting better, they move whatever equipment was able to be safe, they move it to a new location. And if not tomorrow, the day after, those same teams of amazing, brave cooks, women and men are going to start cooking again. This is the Ukrainian spirit. The organization was created to help victims of humanitarian disasters, but this is the first time they've operated in a war zone and the first time one of its relief kitchens has come under attack. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather Bill Karens is with us with hopefully a forecast that doesn't have snow in it. Yeah, this has been a ridiculous snowstorm, John. I mean, we're seeing snowfall totals up to 16 inches in the Adirondacks, and it's not just at the highest elevations. All the way down through Binghamton, the Scranton, that southern tier of New York that I said I was concerned about was hit hard. Uh, right now, we have 250,000 people without power. So a quarter million people without power. It's all because of this heavy snow, the early buds, the blooms, the early leaves on the trees that, that's more surface area for the snow to stick to. And that is just taking trees down. So the power crews are going to have a lot of work ahead of them as the storm exits. And you can see we're not done yet. There's still a really impressive snow band right over the top of Syracuse to Binghamton this morning and now about to rotate through Scranton area. Binghamton has 12 inches already on the ground. Going to pick up another one to two inches from this. And then that band has to go back up through the Adirondacks. And Indian Lake in the Adirondacks has 16 inches of snow. And some of the snow even made it to the valley floors of the Hudson Valley and the Mohawk Valley. Areas around Schenectady picked up five inches of snow. So uh, very historic for this time of year. Additional snowfall, not a lot left in Pennsylvania, southern New York, but in the Adirondacks, we still could see another four to six inches out of this. Vermont, maybe another one to two. And it's going to stay pretty windy behind this storm. 19 million people are included in wind advisories and wind warnings, and it looks like the highest winds will be in areas coastal Maine, also out on Cape Cod, but still pretty breezy this afternoon behind the storm in New York, Philadelphia, and D.C. Minor airport delays are possible all the way back through Pittsburgh State College and in Buffalo. So for today's forecast, we'll say goodbye to our 
April snowstorm in New England. Uh, by the time we get through this evening, the roads should be all cleared up in most cases, especially with that sun angle and the sun coming back up. But, uh, Joe, we'll talk about what's next coming up in the uh, next hour. And uh, it has to warm up. I mean, it just has to. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Well, we will look forward to that. We'll see you in the next hour. Thanks so much, Bill. Appreciate it. Yeah. Coming up on the road again, President Biden traveling to New Hampshire this morning to push his infrastructure plan, how he says the strategy will drive down costs for all Americans. And controversy at the border, the new calls to reinstate restrictions amid a record number of migrants crossing into the U.S. You're watching Morning News Now. President Biden is escaping the beltway today to push the administration's Building a Better America plan. The president is heading to Portsmouth, New Hampshire this afternoon, where he'll discuss efforts to modernize the country's ports and waterways. NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee has a preview. Good morning. President Biden hits the road today, heading to New Hampshire. This is his third trip outside of Washington in just a week as the White House looks to shift his focus to those November midterm elections. So the president's heading to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He'll visit the New Hampshire Port Authority and he'll focus on his infrastructure law, that bipartisan bill that passed the Congress that the president has yet to really focus on. And so the White House wants him to highlight some of the provisions in there that are headed there supposed to benefit New Hampshire. There's a harbor there that's that's receiving some money from the infrastructure bill so that it can receive larger ships and things like that. And this is designed to, what we'll hear from the president today, is that this is all going to help with supply chains, that it's something that the president is go doing to address, address those higher costs that many Americans are seeing. But again, this is designed to focus the president away from international issues. He spent a lot of time on Ukraine. There are polls showing that Americans think that he's overly focused on foreign affairs as opposed to issues here at home. And so the White House is having him hit the road more. This is the first of several stops he'll make this week. The president later this week is also going to Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, again, to highlight his domestic agenda. And so the White House hopes that this will start to build some confidence among Americans that the president is taking their economic interests to heart, that he's working for them. So he's going to highlight things that his administration has already done, that infrastructure bill, and also things that he hopes to accomplish. There's still a stalled agenda that the president has in Congress. The White House is having quiet talks with lawmakers to try to advance that so far. No success. But we're seeing the president try to shift his focus more to domestic issues, even while he's still trying to manage the situation in Ukraine. All right, Carol, thank you. Another big issue for the president is at the southern border, where officials say more migrants cross into the U.S. in March than any other month on record. It comes as authorities brace for a massive surge after the Biden administration lifted a border restriction known as Title 42. NBC News justice correspondent Julia Ainsley has more. Urgent warnings from the border, with the Border Patrol releasing these new images, saying a record 221,000 migrants crossed into the U.S. last month. Local officials expect that could soon double. Numbers like that would be completely overwhelming to our community. The surge is expected after the Biden administration decided to end a COVID border restriction called Title 42. The Department of Homeland Security estimates more than 170,000 migrants are waiting in Mexico, planning to cross when Title 42 is lifted May 23rd. What do you need from the Biden administration between now and May 23rd? Um, plans would be helpful, um, commitment for additional funds. Migrants who cross through the Rio Grande Valley come through this bus station in downtown McAllen. And officials here worry that if the numbers get too high, it could overwhelm the bus station, the shelters, leaving people with nowhere to go and sleeping on the street. We're asking them to reconsider, you know, lifting the uh, the title, title 42. Sheriff Eddie Guerra says he's been told by Border Patrol to have his officers on standby in case the ports of entry are overrun. We're talking about, you know, the deputies uh, dressed in their in their riot gear with uh, uh, their shields and their their helmets and and um, and batons to keep keep the, uh, the, the the crowded bay. The Biden administration is facing bipartisan criticism of its immigration policy, with 1.7 million illegal border crossings last year, an all-time record. 
But at a McAllen migrant shelter, we met a Honduran family who supports lifting Title 42, saying it keeps migrants waiting in dangerous conditions in Mexico. Ava and her husband told us she became a victim of rape. The same person who offered her the job took advantage of her, abused her, and that was how the rape happened. Thanks to Julia Ainsley for that report. And migrant advocates say Ava's story is not uncommon, which is why they argue Title 42 needs to end. South Africa's armed forces are being deployed to help with flood relief efforts after a major storm there last week. NBC's Claudio Labanga has more on that and other news making headlines around the world. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yes, South Africa announced that more than 10,000 soldiers will be deployed to join that uh, relief and rescue operation in, in an area that last week was devastated by deadly uh, floods and mudslides. About 440 people have died and 63 at least are still missing after record rainfalls caused um, rivers to uh, swell and also mudslides that destroyed at least 4,000 homes. Let's move on to another story. It's a sad story, actually, from soccer player Cristiano Ronaldo and his partner, uh, Georgina Rodriguez, announced on social media that baby boy had died. Ronaldo, who plays for Manchester United and Portugal, and his girlfriend announced last October the couple were expecting twins, a boy and a girl. Now, the couple said on social media that the loss of one of the babies is the greatest pain any parent can feel. And a soldier from Wales who fought in the Falklands Wars four decades, four decades ago has been reunited with the nurse who, he says, saved his life. Denzel Connick was a paratrooper in the war between the UK and Argentina in 1982. After he was critically injured in combat, he was treated by Nitsi Pew, I think I pronounced it well, uh, who helped to bring him back from the brink of death. And now he can finally, after four decades, stare once again in her caring eyes, as he called them. Never too late for a reunion like that. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, expensive escape. The upcoming summer travel season expected to be the busiest and most costly one yet. Up next, the growing calls for the feds to intervene. Plus, children in crisis, kids as young as eight could be suffering from anxiety. What parents can do to help in our weekly check-in after the break. time for our weekly mental health check-in where we walk through some of the biggest mental health headlines. We also want to take this moment to pause, take a deep breath, and reflect on our emotional well-being. Dr. George James joins us now to walk through some of these headlines. He's a marriage and family therapist at the Council for Relationships and a friend of this show. Doctor, good to see you. So let's start with that, that big headline we teased just a few minutes ago. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says kids as young as eight should be screened for anxiety by their doctors, even if they are not showing typical warnings warning signs. This recommendation follows the release of CDC data that shows more kids are experiencing a mental health crisis after the COVID pandemic in the wake of still the pandemic. How can a screening like this help children with their mental health? And what can parents do then if they find out their child is suffering? Yeah, good morning, Joe. And yes, you know, this new uh, task force uh, update that came out does say that, like, children as young as eight should be screened. And what this is saying is that sometimes our children are dealing with lots of things, right? They're they're overwhelmed, just like we are. But unfortunately, they might not have the words or the tools to express themselves. So to be able to be screened, to be able to ask questions, are you afraid? Is your stomach or head hurting you? Are you nervous about something? These things will allow children to say yes or to express themselves. And then as a parent, you can help them and uh, and give them the tools necessary. You can create routines. You can create uh, systems that will help them so that they know what to do when they feel anxious or overwhelmed, and they can come to you and talk to you about it. Good advice there. Now, the pharmacy chain CVS is also trying to address mental health among teens and young adults. The company says its walk-in clinics will now be able to assess anyone struggling with mental health and be able to refer people to their local social worker if they need more care beyond that. Access is so important right now. Why is this type of accessibility to mental health services so important? 
Uh, I think this is really great. As we see, the numbers of people being able to to express that they are having mental health challenges is, is skyrocketing. Every different uh, sector, every different uh, type of person is sh sharing that they need the help. So having more access points like CVS, where you can find CVS all over, that someone can go there and confidentially share what they're going through and get the support and get connected to a provider. The biggest thing sometimes is breaking the barrier of entry, where sometimes people don't know how to get a therapist or counselor. This is, makes it so much easier and so that people can get the help that they need, especially right now. Finally, while we have you, I want to talk to you about a Kentucky man who sued his employer after he requested they not celebrate his birthday, citing an anxiety disorder. They went ahead and did it, Andy. Anyway, he ended up winning a lawsuit and was awarded nearly half a million dollars. According to the lawsuit, the employee suffered a panic attack immediately after the surprise and then was fired days later. Now, this might be an extreme situation, but how can we just each and every day respect someone's mental health boundaries, especially in the workplace? And how do we approach sharing those boundaries with our coworkers, especially as so many of us return to face to face work now? Yeah, in this situation, this uh, man was willing and open and vulnerable about what was going on with him and what he was experiencing. You know, if we were to say, I had a peanut allergy, so please don't uh, provide something with peanuts in it, and you just go ahead and do it, you would be ignoring that I have something that I'm concerned about that could really hurt me. That's the same thing when we talk about mental health, when we talk about a panic attack or anxiety. So we have to respect people, respect where they are, and believe that it is serious, not just to say that you are being over the top or you're you're taking this too seriously. He was open and honest about his uh, where he was and that he needed some help. So I think we need to respect people more, and hopefully more workplaces are doing this so they can respect their their uh, their employees and treat everyone fairly. All about respect. Dr. George James, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We do appreciate it. Have a good week. Now, it's Thanks. shaping up to be a challenging spring and summer travel season. Flight prices are soaring. So are cancellations. Now, some are calling on the federal government to intervene. NBC News business and technology correspondent Joe Lane Kent has more on the problems and how to navigate them. In this very busy spring travel season, travelers are already looking ahead to summer, which is expected to be very chaotic. And now consumer advocates are saying the federal government needs to do more to protect passengers. Travelers are gearing up for a chaotic summer in the skies and on the road. Expedia predicting this summer will be the busiest travel season ever. But the desire to escape is colliding with high fuel prices, staffing shortages and cancellations nationwide. We were at the airport for 10 hours. According to the Department of Transportation, more than 110,000 flights were canceled last year alone, driven by weather, yes, but also not enough airline staff and crews. Now, Consumer Reports is calling on Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg to do more to protect passengers and establish a so-called passenger bill of rights. Clear, consistent rules uniformly applied to all airlines in the event of cancellations, delays, baggage problems and getting bumped off a flight. Taxpayers have given this industry more than $50 billion in, in bailouts. Secretary Buttigieg has the authority and has the pulpit to reach out to the airlines, find out what's going on with all these canceled flights. Looking ahead, experts say brace yourself for packed planes and hotels and to pay higher prices. The average round trip fare is now $360, already up about 50% since January. Right now you're at the mercy of the airlines themselves and that's not a pretty picture. Ahead of this busy travel season this summer, there are a few things you can do to reduce your stress. You can book early, not just flights, but also those home rentals and hotel rooms. We're seeing those go pretty fast right now. And you also may want to consider booking refundable options or even booking on points. You can often get those back if your travel plans don't work out. All right. Good advice, Joe and Ken. Thank you. A couple more tips. Experts suggest flying midweek, which will usually have lower cost tickets. Friday and Sunday are usually the most expensive days to fly because, of course, of demand. Coming up, national security be th being threatened by space junk. When we come back, we'll explain the new concerns following a Russian missile test. You're watching Morning News Now. Vice President Kamala Harris toured a Space Force base in California Monday where she announced the United States' new policy on anti-satellite missile tests. Those are military demonstrations where a spacecraft in orbit is destroyed using a missile system. Here's some of what she had to say. 
I am pleased to announce that as of today, the United States commits not to conduct destructive, direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. Simply put, these tests are dangerous, and we will not conduct them. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now to dive more into this. Ken, good morning. So let, let the background here really is Russia launched a missile at one of its own satellites back in November, which created hundreds of pieces of space debris that are now circling the Earth. Help us understand the risk that debris poses to our national security. Well, Joe, there are two threats to national security in this context. There is the space debris. There is also the anti-satellite weapons themselves, which threaten our communication systems. But in terms of the space debris, after that Russian test, there were seven astronauts in the International Space Station. They had to take cover and get in essentially emergency exit vehicles because they were at risk of being disrupted. You know, be, that, that station could have been damaged by the space debris, which travels at like 15,000 miles an hour in, in orbit and can strike a spacecraft like a missile, like a bullet. So it's really dangerous. It's a big problem. And so that's why the United States is doing this. They're also, you know, the United States tested one of these weapons back in 1985. So we have these weapons. Weapons, it's believed, and um, we, we um, don't need to test them anymore, so it's kind of easy for us to say no more tests. But it is a huge um, risk to sort of the security of space. Uh, China has conducted one of these tests, Russia did in the fall, and now the United States, probably knowing that they're not going to be able to negotiate a treaty with Russia in the middle of this war, is going it alone, just making this unilateral move almost to try to shame our adversaries into doing the same thing, Joe. Yeah, I mean, some might argue the vice president is speaking about, you know, establishing norms in space. You talked about some of our rivals there. What is it they're doing in this new theater of conflict? What are their priorities? So uh, our own Tom Costello had an exclusive look the other day at U.S. Space Force in Colorado, and generals there told him that China is poised to outpace the United States in terms of investment in the militarization of space over the next eight years. So China is developing anti-satellite weapons. Um, they did, as I said, test one in 2007. Um, and, you know, we are extremely vulnerable because our entire military communicates through satellites, as, as does our civilian infrastructure. So um, our adversaries are building up their capabilities in space, and that's why the U.S. is also trying to build up defensive posture to kind of deal with that and track um, potential militarization of space. Um, it, it's a really scary prospect and one that is not getting a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean, so if Russia, China, North Korea don't go along, does this put the U.S. at a strategic disadvantage? Well, Republicans are certainly arguing that today. They think this is a bad idea, for the most part, to unilaterally say we're not going to test without the expectation that Russia and China would go along. But, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a precedent for this, not exactly, but in the 1960s, the U.S. negotiated a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union for the good of mankind, you know, not to test nuclear weapons anymore. That's the kind of thing the United States would like to see here. It seems like we're a long way from that, though, Joe. All right. Ken Delaney, an important topic. Thanks so much for speaking with us this morning. We appreciate it. Let's check the pulse of Wall Street this morning. We've got another busy day for earnings on deck. CNBC's Silvana Hanau has more on that and our CNBC Money Minute. Hey, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. Yeah, so Wall Street, it's struggling for direction ahead of a busy day of earnings reports. Stocks slipped slightly yesterday, but Dow, Nasdaq, and S&P 500 have been grinding lower as earnings season heats up with investors looking for insight on how supply chains and consumer demand are holding up, all this amid rising costs and higher interest rates. In focus today, a report on housing starts and earnings from Johnson & Johnson, Travelers, IBM, and Netflix. Amazon is reportedly working on a mystery augmented reality smart home product. Tech news site Protocol reports Amazon is hiring people to work on a new-to-world smart home item. Many big tech companies are dipping their toes into AR and virtual reality devices. Facebook parent Meta already makes the Quest headset and smart glasses with Ray-Ban and aims to release its own AR glasses in 2024. Apple's long-rumored VR headset may launch next year, and Google hopes to ship its headset in 2024. Apple Maps is adding cycling directions for more U.S. cities, including Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit. The update began quietly rolling out to users last week. The feature shows 
the best bike routes, displace things such as elevation and how busy the road is, as well as options for avoiding areas with hills. Apple Maps now provides cycling directions for about a quarter of all U.S. territory, Joe. It'll come in handy in a lot of cities. All right, Absolutely. Savannah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. You got it. This week across NBC, we're focusing on the climate challenge. We start with the story of a tree. It may seem unremarkable to most people, but as NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz discovered, it's what you don't see about mangroves that makes them so important. Hidden along Mexico's Baja coast, an emerald oasis, home to one of the most underappreciated organisms in the world. So everything green that we're seeing around us here, these are all mangroves? Yes, this is uh, one of the largest forests in Mexico. Climate biologist Monica Franco says this untouched wetland is a true ecological wonder. People that might be used to seeing mangroves, do you think that they fully appreciate what they're capable of? No, I don't think so because they don't understand that they have all these superpowers to fight climate change. One superpower, the ability to capture about five times more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than tropical rainforests, pumping it through their roots and straight into the soil where it's trapped for hundreds of years. So these are like CO2 depositing pipes that go straight into the yes. ground? Yes. Wow. The carbon dioxide stored in this mangrove forest is equivalent to emissions released from a quarter of a million vehicles driven for an entire year. Yet despite all the benefits, mangroves are under constant threat from coastal development, climate change, even humans. In the city of La Paz, a group of women from a fishing village defend this fragile mangrove forest from vandalism and ATV riders. She says that it's about showing the new generations to protect something that their grandparents loved. For these women, it's about finding localized solutions to global problems. Do you think that this is possible in other places? Si es posible. And the benefits of mangroves extend beyond land. As Monica has brought us here to Puerto Chale, where we're hoping to see some of the most magical beneficiaries of the mangroves. But for that, we got to get on this boat and we got to hope for some good luck. Turns out mangroves provide essential cover for migrating whales, too. What do the mangroves do? Do they protect the nursery of the, the whales? That's exactly what they do. Great whales come and give birth and rest for several months a year. And mangroves give this protection around the coastline. Oh, there! Whoa! Oh. Look at that! Wow! Look how big that one is! It's making a circle around us. A natural solution to climate change. All thanks to these simple trees of the sea. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Baja, Mexico. Mangroves also help prevent erosion and are the only species of trees in the world that can tolerate salt water. So they not only capture carbon, they also protect shorelines during hurricanes. Coming up, one school back in the spotlight four years after unspeakable tragedy. After the break, the big performance ahead for the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Marching Band as they honor the victims of the Parkland school shooting. Here's some news you can embrace. After a two-year wait, hugs are back at Disneyland. Kids and adults can finally embrace and high-five Mickey, Minnie, and their other favorite characters with the return of one-on-one -on -one interactions. Now, when the world-famous California Park reopened after the pandemic lockdown, visitors were only allowed to wave to characters and take photos from a distance now that COVID restrictions have been scaled back at the parks with many mask requirements dropped in February and parades also returning. In Parkland, Florida, members of the marching band at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School got some good news this week. Years after a major tragedy, they're going to be performing on their biggest stage yet. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders shares their story. How do you prove the worst day in your school's history is not who you are? Teachers at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas tell students every day, never forget the 17 victims. Honor their legacy by doing your very best. Yeah, that I have somebody special to introduce to you. Today in Parkland, Florida, members of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Marching Band found out they're going to the biggest stage in the world. The Stoneman Douglas High School Eagle Regiment has been selected to represent the great state of Florida and perform in New York City in the 2023 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Stoneman Douglas, one of only six high schools headed to the Macy's Day Parade. Two, one, let's have a parade! Very excited. Let's go Macy's. The kids say in this selfie generation, they've learned you achieve as a team. 
results don't matter if you're not having fun with each other, if you're not loving each other, if you're not caring for each other. I think that's first and most important thing. Three and a half million on the, sp on the route and some of them 40 stories in the air <laughs> and then over 40 million on television. It's an experience unlike any other. Drum roll, please. Yeah. 17-year-old <laughs> Alea Bogert. This is the biggest honor. I mean, coming out of COVID, it was super difficult for us, but we're super excited to know that we did something right. Much of the nation knows this school, Parkland, Florida, because of such sadness. Now you get to turn the tables. Absolutely. This school's motto is, first we have fun. <laughs> the kids from Parkland in step and in tune to march right into America's hearts. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Parkland, Florida. Thanks to Kerry for that report. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.